So we have this major disconnect between sales and marketing. How many of you were here for market succession before this? Show of hands. Okay. The good news is, yeah, in a great session, right? Give Marcus a round of applause. That wasn't really great, but Marcus had to run, so he won't even know that it was like a lackluster applause. <laughs> so those of you who are in that session, you're going to see a lot of alignment between what Marcus talks about and what I talk about. Because the challenge is that we create a lot of content, and then, of course, our sales organizations wonder why that isn't necessarily generating the sales that they would like. And then they point to marketing people and say, what the hell is wrong with you? Or I'm not sharing that content. How many of you is that somewhat familiar in your organization? Show of hands. Okay. So I'm going to give you insight in how we fix that. I'm going to share with you how our customers make decisions so that the content we create is better aligned with how they do that. We're going to show you how we modernize our sales and marketing so they're aligned together. And then I'm going to show you five specific case studies of companies doing exactly what I'm talking about today and the results are getting. So that way, when you go back to try and get buy-in from your organization, and people say, well, I don't know if we should do that. I don't know if we should allocate the resources to that. You know, I don't think that's necessarily a priority for us right now. You can say, dummies, here are other companies who are crushing it doing this very thing. Cool? OK. What do you want to get out of this session other than what I talked about? You can shout out. You tell me what you want to get out of this session. Then it's my job to somehow incorporate that into our time together. What do you want to get out of this? Obviously content that's going to drive sales. What else? What would you like to get? Nothing? You're just like burning time here? Yeah? What else? Making my clients more successful. What type of business? Joy events. Okay, cool. Process for, for intake. So what kind of information should we be collecting that's going to influence the right content that's going to drive sales? Because guess what? Those of us in marketing, like Marcus just said, aren't interacting with clients every single day. And if the sales team doesn't give us input, we're probably not going to get good output. Breaking silos? I, w I wasn't sure if she said freaking silos or breaking <laughs> silos. So I just I, I had to process a little bit. So now, now I'm with you. OK, so breaking those silos. And we're going to talk about all those things. I will warn you that some of the concepts we're going to talk about today are going to make you feel uncomfortable. And I want you to feel uncomfortable. I want you to have a different perspective about sales and selling and how we align sales and marketing than maybe you've had in the past. And the reason why we need to think differently is because of this. Let's say you're on the receiving end of a visit from a salesperson. So they've broken through the gauntlet. They probably had to swim across a moat to get to you. And now this salesperson is walking down the hall about to meet with you to pitch their stuff. What adjectives come to mind when you think salesperson? Shout them out. Cheesy. Cheesy, smarmy. By the way, I don't even know what smarmy is, but I hear it all the time from people. Okay, cheesy, smarmy. What else? What other what other terms? Self-interested. Ugh. Right. Aggressive. Right. Pushy. Any industries come to mind? You think stereotypical salesperson? Cars. New or used? Used cars. Right. So that's the preconceived notion we have. Now here's the scary part. That's a fictitious person. I just made it up. And those are the adjectives that everyone in this room has in their minds. Do you think it's possible that your clients have those same adjectives in their head before they have a single conversation with anyone in your organization or they read a single piece of content? Damn straight they do. And we've kind of earned that through people who maybe don't operate as ethically as we do. And now we have to disarm the notion that we're there to sell something early on. Because our clients can only perceive us in one of two ways. Either as someone who's there to sell us something, oh, Jill wants to come and sell us something. We all want to sign up for a meeting like that. Or it's we have this important issue we're trying to address. We've asked Sandy to come out to see whether or not they can help. And which group do you want to be in, the first one or the second one? The second one. And I'm going to show you how we get there. Right? Because it's critical that we know that because when we think about the sales process and our seller process, oftentimes we kind of look at it this look at it this way. Well, there's some initial contact that could be with our website. We look at their needs, we send them a proposal, we go through negotiation, boom, we get to a sale. And that's what salespeople think happens. But guess what? It doesn't happen that way. This is not actually the way it works. What happens is, well, we have this initial contact, and then our client 
starts doing a little bit of research. So our client says, well, you know what, we need to discover more information on our own. So we're going to do a little research on our own and find, find more information. And then, you know what, we need to learn more about these needs to see if it's really consistent with what we're experiencing inside our, our organization. And then, you know what, now this innocent proposal, we want to inquire with other people about what it's like to work with these folks. And then, well, you know what, they gave us, we're negotiating this stuff, but we want to verify, is this really the right price we should be paying for this? If you're not providing this type of content, where is your client getting that information? Competitor or they're making it up? Because someone's asking these questions. So one of the things that we need to better understand is how our customers make decisions so that we can be aligned with that in how we market and sell. Now, one of the things I will tell you that you'll, you heard the same thing if you were in Marcus's session, we gotta stop thinking of sales and marketing as two different things. In fact, all the case studies I'm, I'm going to share with you are organizations where, just like Marcus, we went and we did, a work, we did a workshop. We built unity in those organizations, and they don't even call them sales and marketing anymore. This is the revenue department, and they work together hand in hand, because generally that's the way they like to measure those of us in marketing, right? So when we start thinking about how customers and executives make decisions, one of the things we're going to realize is that it's not a random process. You might think it's kind of like throwing darts, but it isn't. And in fact, I've done research with over 10,000 CEOs and executives around the world on how they make and approve decisions. And I give them this scenario. I say, okay, listen, we have this situation called the Gazertenblatt. So one of your employees, you're playing the role of a CEO, CXO in the organization. One of your employees comes to you and says, oh, dude, we got to buy this Gazertenblatt. It costs $20,000. It takes 45 days for them to implement it. requires no resources at all on our part. And these guys will give us a 10-year guarantee. 10 years, we need it again. They'll do it for free. So I ask these executives, what are the five questions you have to have answered to be comfortable making an informed decision about whether you should approve or deny that request? Do you feel that's pretty realistic? Like in companies, someone comes in, their employee says, I want to buy this. Now they have to get approval. How many of you feel that's kind of a similar process that might happen in your company? Show of hands, right? Something similar that goes on. So it's a real world situation. Now, I'll spare you the first step. So I have people come up with five. Then it's kind of like a reality TV show. And I tell them, well, look, now what I want you to do is I want you to reduce that from five down to three. So now just give me your top three. And so I ask these, literally 10,000 CEOs and executives around the world, different sessions. I break them into groups. They work through this issue together. And I ask them, what are the three key questions you have to have answered to be comfortable making an informed decision? What do you think they are? What are some of the questions they ask? Just raise your hand, shout them out. What, what, do, you, what do you think people ask? Well, make me money. So kind of an ROI related question, right? What's the goal? What do you mean by what's the goal? What do you hope to accomplish with this thing, right? What else? Effort to implement. What's it going to take? Because these guys said no resources, but I don't believe them. They're salespeople, right? I can't trust those people. That's crazy. Who else is using it? What's the risk, right? What else? What happens if I don't get it? So fundamentally, and you're going to see where these all tie together. So people go through this whole exercise together, and then they share their results. We go around to each group, and the cool part is that across 10,000 people, guess what? It's the same freaking questions all the time. And you'll see the commonality in these. So here are the questions that executives ask when they're looking to approve a decision. Should I share them? Yeah, OK. So, so it comes down to this. The first is, what problems do you solve, or why do I need it? I will tell you this is always the top priority question. This is number one. It matters that it's number one. You're saying, well, you're saying it, but it's a compound question. Yeah, it's true. But the reason why is that when people say, what problems do you solve? I say, what do you mean? They say, why do I need it? And sometimes the variation on that is, well, what happens if we don't solve it, which is basically a variation on the same thing. Then the second question is, what's the likely results and outcome? Meaning, what's the ROI, but what are the risks associated with getting that ROI? The likely results and outcome is not what the salesperson says. It's the evidence of what other people are getting. The distant third is, what are the alternatives? 
Now you might think, Ian, that's crazy. How can you say that's a distant third? That's the whole thing, isn't it? So imagine this. You're making a decision. You're talking to a vendor, and you're in complete sync with them about what problems they solve and why you need their help. This is also the vendor you feel has the greatest likelihood of delivering or exceeding the results that you need. Isn't that your vendor? Didn't that answer the alternatives question right there? So if we answer these first two questions really well, the third one becomes implied. If the way your organization is selling today is not aligned with these questions, what are you doing to the sales process? Make it longer or shorter? Longer. If it's not aligned with this, you're making it longer. Now, a lot of times what we do is we as marketers talk about results or outcomes or benefits. Here's the sad part. If they don't understand what problem it solves or why they need it, they don't care what the benefits are. It's like going to the doctor who says, oh, listen, you know what? I, I got good news for you. We're the experts at tennis elbow surgery. Come in next Tuesday, 10 AM, Bob. We get you all sorted out. Bob's like, well, I don't have tennis elbow. No, no, but we're the best, <laughs> right? And, and our recovery period is faster than anybody else's. So 10 AM, right? And that's what it sounds like in most salespeople is they're selling to a problem that the customer doesn't have. And we can't do that. Because if we feel like we're being sold to, what have we been trained to do? When you're on the receiving end of someone who's a pushy salesperson, do you share openly or do you shut down? You shut down. Because that's what we've been taught to do. So if we come across as sales and marketing people like that, then we defeat the whole purpose. Because now we're just repelling people. Because we're just saying, we're the greatest. And they're not necessarily buying it because they want to see that we are. If you don't get results, you got ripped off. If you're the customer and you're not getting the results for what you paid for, you're getting ripped off. So the customer doesn't care that you made a good effort. They don't care that you shipped on time and delivered it to them. If they don't get what they were expecting, they're probably not going to be happy. So we need, as organizations, provide all the tools possible to ensure that our clients succeed. Because here's what I can tell you with certainty. Okay? If we deliver great results, our clients are likely to brag about us to their friends. And if we don't, they're likely to trash us to people they have never even met before. So we can never sell something that we can't deliver results for. So all of our content needs to be structured around making sure that we're finding a good fit for the people who most need whatever it is that you do. Not just anybody who will maybe listen, because they're not going to get results out of that. Now, we also have to think about how our customers search for information. So let's say every time you drove down the road, when you made a right turn, there was a squeaking sound that came from your car. So every time you make a right turn, there's a squeaking sound. What would you type into Google to figure out what's going on? Right? Why is my car squeaking? Right? right turn squeaking sound, maybe the make and model. So have we been trained to search based on description of the problems or based on the solution? Based on the problems, right? On your websites today, do you spend more time talking about the problems that you solve or more time talking about your solutions? Here's an interesting thing. About 18 months ago, on my website, testing a theory, I said, you know what, I'm going to create a page called Problems We Solve. By the way, it happens to be on all my clients' websites now. I have a, have a page called Problems We Solve because of this. And you can kind of guess what the outcome is going to be, or it wouldn't make for a very good story. <laughs> but we created this page called Problems We Solve. Now, keep in mind, my website has 60-plus you know, episodes of podcasts, TV interviews I've been on, different videos, hundreds and hundreds of articles. The single most traffic page on my website after the home page is a page titled Problems We Solve. Hmm. By the way, you also notice that on my website, it's not linked to anywhere else. Nowhere else does it say, oh, click here to link to that page. So we're not creating any links to it that are inflating it arbitrarily. Instead, it's the most boring menu item, yet it gets more traffic than any other, any other page. Hmm. Because of the way our customers make decisions.